Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology. I want to thank you all for joining in on our webinar this morning, and I uh, appreciate everyone's time. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how to deal with the funny fluids, or uh, <laughs> otherwise known as non-Etonian fluids, and we're going to go over some various uh, cases where uh, there were some significant operational cases that DuPont encountered uh, with non-Newtonian foods that they were dealing with and how they're able to overcome them with AFT Fathom. Uh, before we get started, I want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. And so after the webinar is finished, you'll be sent a link. That way you can watch the recorded version again later at your leisure or you can pass it around to your colleagues. It'll also be posted in our webinar library. And another thing that I want to mention before we jump into things here is that we have now officially released AFT Fathom 10. It is available for download. And so if you register and log into our website and go to the downloads page, followed by current versions and over to AFT Fathom, you can download it uh, right over here. And so uh, the full version is uh, of re the release available for you. Uh, call us so that we can give you your license number so that way you can get up and running. Uh, make sure that you have your Fathom, nice, uh, your Fathom 9 license number handy. That way it'll make it easier for us to look up your Fathom 10 license number. So that is something available to you today. And uh, I'm actually going to be demonstrating uh, the model later on with Fathom 10 itself. Now, uh, this webinar is kind of unique in that I, uh, I deviate a little bit from what I usually do. I usually try to show as uh, much of the information in the webinar as I can in the software itself. But today that is you know not as much of the case because there's a lot of content that's more, you know, background and uh, theoretical, and I'm not going to get into crazy heavy math here, but uh, um, the content is mainly on the slides, and then uh, at the end of it, I'm going to jump into the software and go over an example. So uh, it's not as much software playing around as usual, but it'll certainly be educational nevertheless. So. Let's go ahead and jump into things and get started. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what is a non-Newtonian fluid or a, a non-settling slurry? Uh, what type of non-Newtonian fluid modeling capabilities exist? Uh, we'll take a walk through the viscosity models available to you at AFT Fathom. I'm going to go over uh, some highlights on the technical paper that's available on our website called Resolving Operational Problems in Pumping Non-Settling Slurries. Uh, that's the case where uh, DuPont had the operational issues. And because the full technical paper with all of its glory is on our website, I'm just going to hit on uh, some high-level summary points with that. Uh, what was their model, uh, or why was, there not, why was their model not predicting their reality? Uh, what methods are available for dealing with minor losses accurately? And uh, how big of an impact will minor loss corrections have? And we'll talk about all those things today. So what is a non-Newtonian fluid? Uh, a lot of times you'll be dealing with fluid where uh, their viscosity is not the typical uh, Newtonian uh, viscosity. And so, you know, blood, ketchup, peanut butter, uh, various food products, um, you know, think power laws, mega plastics, uh, you know, peanut butter. If you have to push something in order to get it to move, you know, that's a, a non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, I just thought of it now. I wish I would have thought of it a little bit before, but um, there's, uh, you know, videos out there that, you know, they have this little uh, goopy stuff. And uh, they'll do an experiment where they, it's a, a liquid, and it's really goopy, and they'll put it on top of plastic on top of a, uh, a big, giant speaker. And then they'll turn the speaker on with some uh, uh, music, and then the uh, liquid becomes a solid. That's non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, Fathom has had the ability to model non-Newtonian fluids way back to version 3. So uh, what I'm showing you today here with non-Newtonian fluids is nothing new. 
Also, AFT Impulse for doing water hammer analysis, that has the same capability of modeling the same non-Newtonian fluids that Fathom does. So what I show you today here in Fathom, it applies directly to AFT Impulse as well. Uh, you can model power laws, thing in plastics. Uh, there's also some paper stocks. We'll see what you can model here. Uh, and so usually you're going to need to get test data when you want to model those types of fluids. So uh, here's some examples of various non-Newtonian fluids. As you can see uh, by the uh, black line here, the uh, Newtonian fluid uh, is where your uh, shear rate and your shear stress are proportional to each other. So the faster you shear something, the more shear stress that it experiences. Another type is the Bingham plastic. That is uh, essentially paralleling the Newtonian fluid behavior with the uh, same slope. But the key thing is for a Bingham plastic model, you have to push the fluid a little bit. So you have to apply a certain amount of force. This is called the yield stress. Once you overcome that yield stress, then you can start flowing the Bingham plastic fluid and the uh, behavior of it mimics a Newtonian fluid where once it starts moving, the uh, more you shear it, the more shear stress that it'll experience. Finally, we have uh, what are characterized as power law fluids. There's the uh, dilatant fluid, which is the green line here. That's shear thickening. So the faster that you stir something, the harder it gets to be able to stir it. And then we have uh, pseudoplastics or shear thinning. The uh, faster you stir something, the easier it gets over time. Both of those behaviors can be modeled with a power law model in AFT Fathom. And so uh, those are some different non-Newtonian fluid models uh, where the uh, shear rate and shear stress are not proportional with each other. Okay. In Fathom, the way that you can access the different viscosity models is by going to the system properties window. Quick sidestep, here's AFT Fathom 10. Uh, one of the new things is when you very first start the software, uh, in the startup window itself, you actually have access to modify some of your user preferences from the get-go. Uh, you can set up your unit system. Uh, this is a new capability where if you're in any of these particular industries, you can filter out different units that match those industries. That way, um, the other units will still be available, but they won't be uh, cluttering up the ones that you want to focus on. Uh, there's uh, different languages that you can work with. Uh, there's also a brand new isometric grid. And so if you turn on the isometric grid, you can see that in the background here. You can also set a default pipe material. And then if you want to do uh, fire protection calculations with the NFPA codes, you can enable that from the beginning as well. So I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, the way that you can change your viscosity models by going to the system properties window with the uh, pink flask. Uh, nothing's changed on that. Um, as you can see, though, one thing that has changed is with Fathom 10, we now have the uh, NIST RefProp fluid properties available. And so if you want some more accurate fluid properties, you can use the RefProp uh, Ref fluids from NIST. They are available in the standard software. Um, that's not what I want to show you. Uh, it's the viscosity model. So here you've got uh, paper stocks, uh, both uh, the two different methods, power laws, Bingham plastics. Basically, the easiest thing to do is if you don't have the constants for this equation already, you're going to want to calculate them from real logical data. So if you click on this option and then choose calculate constants, here's where you enter your shear rate versus your shear stress, and then that will fit this equation for you. And so uh, that's how you would model a non-Newtonian fluid in Fathom. Very simple, straightforward, and easy. All right, back to this here. So the technical paper that I'm going to be talking about today can be found right on our website. If you go to AFT.com, 
under the Learning Center, followed by Technical Papers. This is the technical paper that I'm talking about, the third one from the top, Resolving Operational Problems in Pumping non settling Slurries. This will give you a brief abstract, and then you can view the paper, and this goes into great detail about what the problems were, uh, the methods behind uh, correcting losses, which we'll talk about today, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's where you can find this technical paper. So what was the problem in DuPont's system? They had five individual pumping systems that they were dealing with, and they were pumping the same fluid in all of them. And so when they were testing out their new fluid, the pilot plant worked satisfactory, or satis uh, it, it worked well um, until there were new production requirements that were imposed. And so once they impose those new uh, production requirements in moving from the uh, uh, lab testing to the uh, pilot plant and whatnot, that's when they started experimenting uh, problems. So uh, it was a, a new uh, lab scale developed slurry grade that they were dealing with. Uh, the problems that they had, they were uh, experiencing significant liquid heels left in the suction vessels and there was a significant amount of fluid left over when the pumps stopped working. And so uh, significant liquid levels, three to five feet high. And so the suction vessel liquid levels, they stopped dropping and that fluid just sat there and uh, the flow rate through the piping system went to zero. <clears throat> they weren't sure if this was a, uh, a problem on the suction side or the discharge side of the uh, system at that time. Overall, the uh, uh, amount of liquid that was left over uh, caused significant losses in their product yield. So that's definitely something that you want to make sure to avoid is uh, make sure that you're getting all your fluid pumped through that you need. Also, the other problem was that their flow rates that they actually needed were not adequate for the production demands. Uh, also, they uh, did not ensure enough pressure delivery to various areas of their system that required a minimum operating pressure. So lots of issues here that they were dealing with and they had to find a way to fix it. So uh, it was time for a flow analysis. Uh, when the uh, pumps ran um, with their flows and pressure and power data, uh, the uh, model that they built matched uh, the predicted value or the the predictive values matched very well uh, for their original uh, lab scale cases. So there's no problem with the pump performance. Uh, however, there is a time where the pumps entered a flow regime and they couldn't pump anymore. And uh, that's when the flow went to zero. There's a huge uh, loss in pressure and power. And uh, they had uh, lots of discharge piping around 400 feet long. And uh, the, that long runs of piping had lots of fitties in there, uh, branch flow tees, uh, elbows, diameter changes, uh, several types of valves, uh, lots of losses. When they modeled their minor losses with basically standard K-factor methods that you can get from handbooks or the ones that are already built into Fathom, uh, the model was showing there should not be a problem with the fluid delivery on the discharge side. So the model was showing that everything should be working fine. Well, uh, here's some things that they thought caused the issue. Uh, one of their ideas was maybe the uh, recirculation valves were dramatically oversized, but they found out that this was not the case because the valves, even though oversized, they were very much closed and their flow rates were verified with the flow meter. So uh, that was not the issue. Another thing is that uh, they were able to verify that their suction vessel mixers were working properly. A lot of their suction vessels had to have a, a mixer inside them in order to shear the fluid enough so it could flow. So uh, there wasn't any problems in there. Uh, another thing that they thought might have happened was that the uh, flow drop-off that they are experiencing was indic indicative of a NPSH knee curve effect where at a certain uh, NPSH level, the uh, 
provided head from the pump will just dramatically drop off. Um, this was not the case. Three systems had uh, some more fittings in the suction piping, and so uh, this was not always the case right across the board. Uh, the final thing that they thought is uh, they had a theory where uh, their losses through the fittings may not have been properly accounted for when operating their flow rates in the laminar regime. And so uh, that was a theory that they decided to explore uh, additionally. So when they started exploring uh, the uh, loss calculations for fittings, they went through this process here uh, for calculating pressure losses in pipes the Darcy Weisbach equation is one of the more popular methods for calculating those pressure losses. And so uh, this is the same calculation, regardless if it's Newton or you know laminar flow or turbulent flow. Uh, the friction factor is different for laminar and turbulent conditions. And so the Darcy Weisbach equation accounts for both flow regimes. So as far as pressure drop through valves and fittings, there are two different methods that are uh, widely used for calculating those losses. Uh, one method is with using K factors. So that's where the pressure loss across a fitting is equal to a K factor times one half rho V squared. Uh, that's the more common method. Uh, it's a lot more common to be able to find uh, K factor data. And uh, there's, lots of k-factor loss models built into Fathom. The other method is using equivalent lengths. So instead of using a k-factor, they use this FL over D term in order to characterize the pressure loss across their fittings. And when you combine the FL over D with the k, or when you combine these two equations, here's how the k-factor and the uh, equivalent length method relates to each other. Uh, one quick side note is that a new feature that came out with Fathom 9 was you you could then model directly equivalent length. So when you have an equivalent length for your fittings, you can model that directly in Fathom 9. So in laminar flow, the question is, do standard k-factor methods or equivalent length methods work in those laminar conditions. Uh, how should engineers handle the pressure drop for these fittings in those circumstances? Uh, as far as the uh, non-Tonian fluid behavior, uh, does the behavior of pressure loss through fittings uh, follow the, the same way that it does in pipes? If so, how? So the calculation issues, uh, uh, K factor is uh, the more popular method for calculating losses through fittings. Uh, the issue is that the uh, loss methods were developed under turbulent flow conditions. It's rare that you'll find K factor loss models that were developed under laminar conditions. And so that's the issue is can you directly apply your standard K factor loss models to laminar flow? Uh, most industrial applications operate in the turbulent regime, but some don't. And uh, one of the things that they found was that K factors and equivalent lengths yield, you know, very similar results for turbulent flow. In laminar flow, there is confusion on how to apply those methods for laminar flow applications. So here are some methods that are available. Uh, there's a 2K method and a 3K method. And so you got 2K and 3K where your loss model is dependent upon each of these individual terms here. The 3K method is similar to the 2K method, but you have just some additional terms here. The, uh, the 3K method is usually the most accurate for uh, correcting pressure losses across your fittings. Uh, however, the issue is that the 2K and 3K methods, they only apply to certain types of fittings. So 
Uh, this table is pulled out from uh, one of those references. I believe it comes from uh, uh, Darby. And these, this is the limitation to where uh, the uh, fittings aren't directly applicable to all types of uh, losses that you would have. And so that's a, a problem where you need to have something that might be more uh, directly applicable to circumstances if you don't have exactly these losses in your uh, systems. One quick note that I want to make is uh, if you are using these correction factors in Fathom, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, ATKF method soon. When you're using uh, 3K or ATKF method together, it's only going to use the 3K method for the fittings. So it's basically the important note is that uh, we're not going to double uh, account for the uh, losses in that way. So uh, just something to be aware of. So there's another method available called the adjusted turbulent K factor method. So what we have here for the adjusted turbulent K factor method is we start with the K factor equation based upon the equivalent length for turbulent flow. Uh, way out here on the Moody chart. Uh, that's where your standard loss models are going to be developed at. We then apply this same relationship to laminar circumstances where what we want is we want this laminar K factor. That's what we need. And the uh, K factor needs to be based upon the laminar friction factor and the equivalent length for laminar flow. Well, what we found was after doing some studies, the equivalent lengths for both laminar and turbulent conditions are essentially equal. And so with equating the equivalent lengths here, we now have a new relationship where the K factor for laminar circumstances equals the turbulent K factor, that's your standard K factor loss model, times this ratio of friction factors. The uh, friction factor laminar is your actual laminar friction factor in your pipes divided by the turbulent friction factor. The uh, turbulent friction factor is at very high Reynolds numbers uh, way out here. This is the adjusted turbulent K factor method where we are taking the original K factor under turbulent flow and we are adjusting it with this friction factor ratio, and that's how we're getting a new K factor for laminar circumstances. Now, in the technical paper that I talked to you about, it has these same graphs in them to compare the losses under those different correction factor relationships. So I just want to highlight some of the uh, points here. Um, this is a graph of the predicted head gradient in a two-inch diameter pipe, and the first case here is if we had no fittings at all. So this is just a straight run of pipe, no fittings, and this is our base case. And you can see here how the pressure loss uh, increases with decreasing uh, Reynolds number and so uh, that's what happens when you get into those laminar flow circumstances that's our that's our base case right there the next case is if we were to lump in a handful of fittings into the pipe itself maybe some elbows per se uh, we can get this uh, total K factor of uh, 3.17 these are non corrected losses and so what you'll see is the behavior follows uh, very closely to having no losses at all. And then when we're not correcting those losses, the uh, laminar values uh, match each other uh, quite well. So this is where we start to have a problem because we don't have this difference in head gradients for laminar flow. And we probably should. Need to turn my pointer back on. So now we're going to start incorporating the effect of the correction factors. So the blue line that I just added on there is if we used the 3K method for those same fittings. So we have the uh, the same uh, 
fittings that we used, but we applied the K-factor method. And as you can see, for turbulent flow conditions, the 3K losses are very, very close to what the losses are without correction. So the data matches each other very well. But now, as you start to get more laminar flow, this is where you start to see a significant deviation. So uh, your pressure losses across these fittings are not matching the uncorrected values anymore. Now, being engineers, we want to make sure that the uh, data can match or we want to you know, have uh, consistency so we can apply the equivalent length methods. And if we apply the equivalent length methods, that follows the uh, Darby 3K method very closely. Uh, turbulent flow, it, they're all the same losses basically. And then as we uh, get more laminar, you can see how the head gradient across those fittings matches 3K. Finally, we have the adjusted turbulent K factor method, and that's matching both the uh, equivalent lengths and 3K method itself. Uh, there's two graphs that that technical paper has. Uh, the one that I just showed you was the uh, case for a uh, two inch diameter pipe. We also have a case for the 24 inch diameter pipe. And as you can see, the differences in pressure losses for a 24 inch diameter pipe are much more significant. So you have a bigger spread. Uh, as you can see with all of these methods compared side by side with each other, clearly the uh, case where you're simply applying the same standard K factor loss models to laminar flow conditions dramatically under predicts what the pressure losses across those fittings will be. So it's really, really important to make sure that you are correcting your loss factors in those cases where you have laminar flow. Now, if you have 3K data available to you, such as that table, and if your fittings are following those relationships, use 3K data. It's a bit more accurate and preferred for usage. However, uh, if you have cases where you're dealing with other types of fittings, maybe screens or, or other types of elbows or valves, you've got to have a way of being able to still account for correction to cross those losses when you don't have the data for the 3K method. So in that case, that's where you can use the adjusted turbulent K-factor method. And the nice thing is because it's based upon equivalent lengths here, if you have turbulent flow, that correction factor becomes one. So you can apply the ATKF method in both laminar and turbulent flow conditions. Uh, those are just a couple of points I've already talked about there. Uh, now, let's say that you want to apply the ATKF method to non-Newtonian circumstances. You actually can apply ATKF to non-Newtonian flow. And in order to maintain the basis of the equivalent length method, your turbulent friction factor has to be the Newtonian value. And so the uh, relationship, if you want to use ATKF for non-Newtonian flows, this is what you're looking at. You've got your K factor for non-Newtonian flow based upon the turbulent K factor for Newtonian flow. And then you've got your, relate, your uh, ratio of uh, friction factors, uh, non-Newtonian friction factor, turbulent Newtonian friction factor. So that's how you can still apply ATKF for non-Newtonian flows or laminar flows. It's uh, very generally well applicable to all the different situations that you might encounter. So how do you turn on these different correction factor methods? Well, the ATKF method is actually turned on for you by default. So if you go into Fathom and then under the System Data tab, this is where the ATKF method is turned on. So simply check that option, and we're going to apply the ATKF method for corrections on laminar and non-Newtonian flows. 
This is where you can specify what types of losses that you want to apply them to and what types of fittings. There might be some fittings and losses in this list that you don't want to apply the ATKF corrections for. Uh, for example, uh, maybe you've got a, uh, a heat exchanger in there and you don't want to apply those corrections, just leave it unchecked. So if you click on Fathom Default, this is exactly what you're going to see for the uh, laminar non-Etonian corrections. That's ATKF. It's through the system properties window. How do you turn on the 3K method? Well, the 3K method, you would turn on by going to the analysis menu and then using extended options and then simply choose include 3K. This is all you have to do. You can also do equivalent lengths as well. If you choose include 3K from Darby, you're going to see the uh, window change a little bit. So now, if you go into an elbow, you now have a new option, 3K, and you have these different fittings that you can apply it to. And here's your 3K values down below, and this gives you the exact equation for reference on how it's applying those uh, various factors. And so that's how you turn on the 3K method. And again, it can only be used for certain types of losses. All right, back to DuPont's issue. Before, they were not applying the ATKF corrections and they were experiencing massive issues and their model predicted that they should not have issues. This is because they were not applying those correction factors to their fittings. Once they went through and they applied the ATKF method for their fittings, they found that they're actually having negative MPSH margins. So when they were expecting to have higher MPSH values, Clearly, they did not, and so this is where they were finding that they were having lots of operational problems. The uh, minor losses had a significant system pressure loss contribution in this case. Uh, usually, they don't have a high contribution, but for non-Etonian or laminar flows, they certainly can. So after DuPont was able to have a more accurate way of predicting their pressure losses across their fittings using the ATKF method, they were then able to figure out what type of modifications they needed in their system in order to raise their MPSH values. So uh, some things that they did is uh, they had lots of suction piping that contained branch flow T's. Uh, in some cases, they tried to eliminate as many of those branch flows as they could. So that was one of the modifications. Another modification is that they tried to minimize the amount of directional changes, which also had an impact on eliminating various fittings. Uh, if they did absolutely have to have a direction change in their system, they would use large radius elbows with an R over D of three. So that's how they were able to really eliminate some of those pressure losses. Uh, they also eliminated the usage of abrupt uh, area changes and did not use commercially available reducers. Instead, they would use conical shaped transitions with a 15 degree taper. That way it had a very, very uh, smooth transition from one diameter to another, and uh, that would dramatically minimize pressure losses in those circumstances. And finally, they uh, were able to increase some of their suction pipeline sizes to at least one size larger than the pump suction flange for the majority of the piping run. So that really helped boost a lot of the suction pressure that they had. Overall, in a, a couple of systems, uh, several of the fittings in the discharge piping were significant, and they were able to either eliminate or modify a lot of those as well. Uh, they also included a, a slightly larger impeller for their pump in a couple of the systems. So now, when they went through and they made their modifications to their piping system, they were still using the ATKF corrections in that case, and they were able to find now they have a much better MPSH margin. So before modifications, 
here's where they were standing at when they applied ATKF. After the piping modifications, they had much better suction pressure there that they were able to uh, deal with. Now, I also have a summary slide of the results in terms of the pressure losses themselves. So we focus on the pressure losses. Uh, this is the pressure loss. Um, whoops. Uh, this is the pressure loss right here before they accounted for their ATKF correction. So as you can see, their pressure losses across those fittings using standard K-factor loss models, very, very small. Once they incorporated ATKF, they had significant amounts of pressure losses. So we went from half a PSI to 12.3 PSI, 0.1 to 16. So uh, they were able to easily find, wow, you know, these fittings and losses are contributing to much higher uh, pressure losses than what they were expecting to see. Finally, after they were able to uh, apply their modifications and they uh, still use ATKF, they're able to have a dramatic reduction in the pressure loss across fittings. So, you know, in this case, they went from you know, 12.3 to 7.1, uh, 16 down to 11, <clears throat> so on and so forth. And so uh, that's what they were able to do to fix their issues. Uh, keep in mind, the ATKF method only affects pressure losses in fittings, not in pipes. That being said, if you were to uh, lump in pressure losses into a pipe itself, uh, for example, if I drew a pipe on the workspace here, open it up, and I specify a, a diameter. If you do apply fittings and losses in this case here, maybe there's three of these. The ATKF methods will correct uh, these pressure losses right here. So you still can account for your correction factors on those losses when you lump in the fittings into a pipe window like that. So that way you don't have to always still model the junction losses to be explicit just for accounting for your corrections properly. Okay. So now, for the moment that you've all been waiting for, I'm going to jump into the software here. And so uh, I want to take a look at the uh, uh, one of the standard Fathom examples. And so uh, if, you were run, if you run Fathom and you go to the Help menu right here, there's a button that is called Show Examples. And if you go to Show Examples and then pick your designer units, it pulls up our examples help file, which contains a whole bunch of walkthrough tutorials on how to use various features of the software. So these are incredibly useful. They will walk you through how to build each of those models from scratch. Uh, we also have tons of examples on how to use the add-on modules as well. The model that I am starting with today is the one from this example, non-Newtonian phosphates pumping. And so that's the example that I started from. Uh, the uh, example and also the data for that model that you would build is for pumping a phosphate uh, slime. And the example is uh, from Wilson, uh, the, uh, the book for... Uh, uh, slurry transport using centrifugal pumps. And uh, that's where the data for this example comes from. So what this example is intended to do is you've got three different systems where you've got different flows and you're trying you're essentially trying to size a pump. You're trying to size a pump and you want to make sure that it'll work for each of these different flow rates. And there's different power or there's different non-Newtonian models that you're using. There's a scale up option a power law option and a big and plastic option. What I did was I took this model here and uh, I modified it significantly uh, for my own circumstances and built respective scenarios uh, so that I could show you what the effect is when you're using 
the various correction methods, uh, comparing standard uh, losses to 3K losses to ATKF losses. And so here's the model that I uh, expanded upon. Basically, I uh, made it look, I, or I made it a uh, isometric drawing. And so that's one of the changes I made. I also incorporated a handful of fittings. So I've got, uh, looks like uh, four elbows in the system and three valves. One thing I want to point out is that this is a regular valve right here. That is actually intended to simulate a check valve downstream of my pump. The reason why I had to use a regular valve is because when I used the 3K check valve loss model, I had to use that with the regular valve item. So uh, that's what I did when I built the model. I also have several scenarios where I did my study. So uh, let me go ahead and open up that model now. While we're waiting for this to open, um, just a quick summary here. In case you're not familiar, uh, we offer several different uh, products that will help you very much for a full solution in any type of piping system that you're trying to deal with. Uh, AFT Fathom models incompressible flow for liquid piping systems. AFT Aero models compressible flow for gas piping systems. And AFT Impulse models water hammer for liquid piping systems. Each of the uh, products that we offer here includes several add-on modules that are available. Make sure that you uh, spend some time to check those out. It, uh, those tools can help you out with your own systems. And so if you go to AFT.com under products, just go to software overview. And here's where you can find some basic information about each of our products. And if you click on one of them, You'll find more detailed information about that product. And if you scroll down, here's where you can find more details about the add-on modules that are available. So be sure to check out those other products if you haven't had a chance to do so already. Okay, so I'm in my model here, or I'm in Fathom. Let me open up my model. All right, so... What I had to do was I had to kind of go about this in a bit of a uh, backwards way. What I had to do was I had to create a scenario where I turned on the 3K method. And when I turned on the 3K method, that's how I was able to specify what types of fittings that I'm using for those different junctions for my elbows and my valves. Well, the thing is, those uh, you can only find the 3K loss models because, again, 3K only applies for a few types of losses, not everything. What I had to do was I had to run the model because it doesn't report what an actual standard K factor is here. I don't know what that is. So I had to run the model first with using uh, Newtonian water. So I've got water and my viscosity model is Newtonian. And I ran the model with the top system right here using my 3K values. And because the fluid is water and the viscosity model is Newtonian, the 3K losses should not be any different at all from your standard losses. So when I ran this model, I figured out what my... Uh, standard K factors were for each of these different uh, junctions and whatnot. Then I went into the bottom system here and I applied those as user specified K factors. Okay, so this is what I had to do in order to be able to get to a point where I could compare apples to apples. So after I was able to go through this roundabout method, I was able to, I was able to create these three individual scenarios. So here in my standard K factor scenario, this is using the K factor that I calculated from the previous scenario. So that's my user specified K factor. And I did that 
for each of my different losses. So here's my user specified K factor, and then here's my user specified K factor for my uh, valves. And as you can see here, this scenario is using water at one atmosphere. It's a Newtonian viscosity model, and I've turned off corrections, okay? This is my base case for just standard losses under regular turbulent flow conditions. The next scenario was I kept using the same K factor that was user specified that I found, but in the system properties window, I kept using water and Newtonian by turned on the ATKF method here. So that was the second scenario that I created. Third scenario, this is where I used my 3K method for each of my fittings. So this is my swing check valve. Uh, this is my elbow. And those are my 3K loss models. With using the 3K loss models, I'm still using water and Newtonian fluids, but I've turned off ATKF again. So the reason why I had to do these three scenarios is I wanted to make sure that the results were exactly the same in each of them because here I'm comparing apples to apples. So I've already ran the model in each of those three scenarios and I've already gotten results. So if I go to my output window here, I'm comparing the results from each of those scenarios side by side with each other. So let me go in here and make sure I've got the right scenarios turned on. I don't, so let me go in here, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to hide the pipes, and what I want to focus on is the uh, component losses here. If you look at the uh, losses for elbows and valves, here's the loss factors. So as you can see, my standard K factor loss factor is the same as when I turn on ATKF, and it's the same value that results from using the 3K method. So if I double click on this 3K method, here's my uh, three loss values. As you can see, uh, this is what it's reporting. It doesn't tell me what the resulting loss factor is that would be applicable to the other circumstances. I had to run the model first to figure out what that was. So once I ran the model, I figured out this was my K factor, and then I applied that same K factor as uh, input for my other two scenarios. As you can see here, the loss factors and the pressure losses across each of my elbow fittings are exactly the same. That's what I expect for using water for a Newtonian viscosity model. And if you look at the losses across your valves, same idea. I've got my <coughs> K factors for my valves. They're all the same for each of the three different valve types. And then the pressure loss across each of them is the same. So essentially, this is what I did to create my, uh, my control to make sure that everything was consistent and doing the calculations the right way. After I got that set up, I right clicked on my Newtonian water scenario and I cloned it with the children. So when I cloned it, I created the, new, it created the new power loss scenario, and for my power loss scenario, this is where I went in and I modified the fluid properties. So I've got my density and my dynamic viscosity for my non-Newtonian fluid, and for my viscosity model, I used power law. The help file example uh, right here, this actually has you enter rheological data. And so in the previous example, there was rheological data uh, in here for shear rate and shear stress. In order to simplify my model, I just took out that rheological data and I entered the constants here directly. Once I made that change, that change propagated down to each of these scenarios. So I only needed to make the change once, not multiple times. So here's my power law fluid here. So now, in these three scenarios, that's where I'm using my power law fluid. 
Uh, it's got my user specified density and my viscosity, and then my power law non Newtonian constants in each of them. The uh, standard K factor one, uh, this scenario right here, uses just user specified K factors for all my losses. Again, that's my base case. The reason why I'm doing that is because I wanted to show here's what the pressure losses will be across these fittings when you're not accounting for any correction factors. So that's the base case for the power law fluid. My second scenario is where I'm still using those user specified K factors, but I've turned on the AETKF method. So if I just go in, um, here's my standard method. If I open up the system properties window, I'm not applying correction factors. And I've got my user specified K factor. If I go to the next scenario, I have that same user specified K factor that I had in the previous scenario, but here I'm turning on the ATKF method. So now in this scenario, the K factors are going to be cor corrected using the adjusted turbulent K factor method. And so you're going to see how the pressure losses are uh, uh, higher across those fittings than the standard scenario. And then finally, for the three K scenario, this is where I'm using the uh, standard 3K, uh, the 3K loss models. And for the system properties window, I've turned off ATKF just to make sure that it's not double counting for itself. So I've already ran the model. Let's take a look at the results. I need to make sure I'm showing the right results again here. One, two, three. There we go. Okay, so let's take a look at the elbows. What I want to point out with the elbows here is that, A, the loss factors are all the same because they're dependent upon upstream and downstream diameters. So as you can see here, the standard loss factor is going to be the same for each of these uh, five elbows in each scenario. So that's the first thing. Let's take a look at the green rows. The green rows here represents the adjusted turbulent K factor corrections. So as you can see, the K factors essentially went from 0.4 to 0.75. That's a fairly significant increase in loss factor. If you examine the associated pressure loss, we went from half a pound of pressure loss to just over one pound of pressure loss. So uh, when you take all of these elbows into account, you start to have some significant pressure losses in your elbows. And uh, if you were not accounting for these corrections, you wouldn't know that. The model would not be reflecting reality that you would actually see in the system. And then finally, I have my 3K, which is the orange line. So the 3K method, as you can see here for the elbows, it's slightly less than the ATKF method. So ATKF in this case is slightly predicting a little bit higher of a loss factor. And for the 3K, you have slightly less of a pressure loss. But as you can see, the results are still very comparable to each other in comparison to not applying for corrections at all. So this just goes to validate how it's really important to take those correction factors into account. Now, there's something interesting going on with the valves. If we look at the valves, you can see the same sort of behavior for the first two valves here. So we go from a loss factor of 4.6 with a standard loss model to 8.5. And, and then uh, this is for the first valve in the line. The valve I'm using to model a check valve goes from 1.3 to about 2.5 for the loss factor. If you look at the associated pressure losses, they are significant. 6.4 PSI to about 12, and then 1.8 to about 3.4. So you have a dramatic increase in pressure loss across your fittings. Now here's the interesting thing <clears throat> that I was talking about. If you look at the orange line for the 3K method, it is still having a higher loss factor and a higher pressure loss 
than the standard method when it was not accounting for your corrections. But the interesting one is the valve at the very end. And so if you look at the valve at the very end, here's your loss factor based upon standard methods, 0.5. For some reason, <laughs> the loss factor is actually less than the standard value. So in this particular valve, the 3K method is actually decreasing your pressure loss, and it's uh, as well as your loss factor. So here, for whatever reason, uh, I'm as baffled as all of you are. Um, for this particular valve, for whatever reason, the 3K values, you're actually getting less loss. And so uh, that's something that you would uh, want to know about in that case. And, uh, and so I'm not sure why it does that, but it's something that can happen. Um, you know, that's, that just goes to show how, you know, all of these are based upon correlations. And so if you are using these loss models in a situation that is outside the bounds of where the correlations were developed, the loss methods may not be directly applicable. So in this particular case here, since this 3K value is less than the standard value, you might want to focus on, well, I'm going to toss that out. I'm going to focus on the ATKF method because for this valve right here, the ATKF method is adjusting the losses in this fashion, and that way you would at least be being conservative on that. You can also see how it affects the pump performance. So if you look at your pump performance, you need only 189 feet of head for your standard K factor model. If you are using the ATKF corrections to properly account for those losses, you need 20 more feet of head in order to overcome that extra amount of resistance. Uh, even if you're using the 3K method, you still have to have about six feet more ahead. So uh, in this particular case, I'd probably pay attention to the ATKF one. So that's where you just have to use your own engineering judgment if you are able to get any sort of test data to validate these cases, that's the best way to figure out which value to go with. All right, so um, that's pretty much what I had planned for you today. Uh, just a reminder, we've got tons and tons of useful content on our website. Uh, be sure to go to AFT.com under Learning Center. You can find information about our training seminars. If you're able to make it to one of our training seminars here in Colorado Springs, uh, we've got some coming up next here in uh, the first week of June. <clears throat> Try and stay a couple extra days, perhaps, while you're out here. There's a lot of beautiful stuff to do and see in Colorado Springs in a very close proximity to each other. We've also got uh, tech papers, case studies, white papers, several tips and tricks articles, video tutorials, and our webinar library, of course, where you can find several of our previously recorded webinars all in one area right here. So make sure that you guys check that out. Uh, what you're going to receive next is a link to today's recorded webinar. Uh, it should come out sometime before the end of the week. Can't guarantee that it's going to come out today. Uh, it might, but uh, if it doesn't come out by the end of this week, then email me. Don't email me right after the webinar here and say send me the link because we'll send it to you. Don't worry. Uh, you'll also get information about upcoming webinars. You can download a free demo or request an evaluation license. Uh, if you're in the United States, you can find our pricing on our website. If you're outside the U.S., please be sure to contact your channel partner and they'll be happy to get you a quote. Uh, thank you all very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Hope you all learned more about how to deal with uh, non-Newtonian fluids and what to do if you're in a laminar flow situation. And, uh, you know, if any of you are dealing with a system and you are exhibiting laminar flows or dealing with a non-Newtonian fluid and you have model data that matches uh, your physical measurements, those would be excellent candidates for our Platinum Pipe Award contest. If you go to About and then Platinum Pipe Award on our website, you can learn about the Platinum Pipe Award contest that you can enter a model for. Win $2,000 of an AFT credit for your company and $500 Amazon gift card for you. 
So if you have any non-Newtonian fluid stuff that you're doing or laminar flow stuff, those are excellent case studies. So please send those in to us, and we can uh, you can enter in for our contest, and maybe you'll win. All right. Well, uh, thank you all very much. If you have any further questions down the road, please do not hesitate to uh, send me an email or give us a call, and we'll be glad to assist. Take care, everyone, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day.